Good morning and welcome to the French Pavilion for uh, this event called uh, Federating All Actors for uh, Protecting Great Apes, uh, supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the uh, National History Museum and the uh, Great Ape Survival Partnership. On behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'd like to thank all our guests. Some of them come from really far away and uh, they came here to talk about great apes and about the emotion number 115 called strengthening great ape conservation in and outside of protected areas involving local actors. We don't have much time. So now I turn to Sabrina Kreef. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank Luca Ivernel from the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs because he made it possible to organize this event at the French Pavilion. And thank you for being here. As uh, Luca said, uh, we are here to talk about a challenge, a challenge that was uh, posed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We need to federate all uh, actors. It, we are calling for help. It is much more than a challenge. Indeed, just like one million species nowadays, great apes are under threat and very soon great apes might disappear in our natural in nature. That's why we decided to try and identify ways to act and ways to uh, to change things. So there are uh, nowadays seven species of great apes. There is the chimpanzee, the bonobo, and there are gorillas and orangutans. They are all under threat. They are on the red list of the IUCN. It is uh, forbidden to buy them, to uh, to trade them, and to eat them. However, it, they are still under threat. They are threatened by the loss of their habitats. They live in the rainforest. It is a really rich ecosystem with many riches. It is crucial. It is a crucial environment for them as well as for actors living nearby and for human beings who needs this forest and these water resources food resources. Great apes embody our excesses. That's the reason why we want to get together to save them and to save all the other species that live with them as well as humankind. So if we are not too centered on ourselves, on human beings, we can uh, we can protect them. They uh, can reach the age of 70 years and uh, our target uh, is to protect them. And by protecting them, we will protect the uh, rich flora of the rainforest as well as many other species who have lived together for many uh, generations. There are very little species who live as long as chimpanzees. Many efforts have been undertaken these past 40 years. 70% of the great apes population have disappeared, and uh, so we need to act. Through international cooperation, different actions were undertaken. And during the first part of the session, we will try to identify ways to strengthen the cooperation. We will talk about the uh, motion 115. And there is a small working group of the uh, IUCN working uh, here. Some of them are members uh, of the uh, Natural History Museum. Some uh, others uh, work with bonobos. There is the WWF. 
F. There are many actors involved, and together we try to identify solutions that haven't been uh, tackled, addressed before. We are trying to create a network of local stakeholders. Uh, these uh, local actors are already supported by different projects, but in a fragmented way. We want to uh, create uh, two alliances, one in Africa and one in Southeast Asia, and through the uh, network, these alliances will gain visibility and they will be able to create synergies uh, between their actions on the ground. So we will now uh, present you all these projects as well as the actions we'd like to undertake. We hope that this motion will be implemented from now on, and that's the uh, purpose, the, the target, the, the goal of the IUCN. We're not here to talk. Well, we're here to talk, but not only. Uh, this Congress is a key moment uh, to launch projects. I'll be brief. We don't have much time. Without further ado, uh, we are going to talk about international cooperation with three panelists, Russ Mittermeier, we will have a guest from the uh, Arcus Foundation who mobilizes uh, financial uh, backers. And there uh, will also be Joannes Rufish from the Great F Survival Partnership. They will present the different projects uh, uh, underway and they will uh, tell us how they work on the ground with local stakeholders. Good morning. Uh, to start, I will say that I speak French well, but I don't have much time and it's faster for me to speak in English. I apologize. Hello, Russell Witterwire, je suis le directeur d'une commission de la Group of Wildlife Conservation, large avec 700 membres. C'est l'un des, des groupes les plus éminents. Nous sommes divisés en 11 sections, des sections principalement régionales. Il y a des sections qui sont spécifiques aux grands singes. C'est d'ailleurs la section la plus large. Il y a euh, environ 144 And, uh, membres uh, dans the, uh, cette section réservée aux grands singes et nous uh, comptons parmi nous les meilleurs spécialistes du monde, les meilleurs spécialistes des grands singes. Nous avons parmi eux des personnes des États-Unis, du Cameroun et ici présent aussi Johannes Refich. Et dans notre section qui porte sur les grands singes, il y a plusieurs divisions qui donc travaillent sur les grands singes. Il y a Johannes avec le GRASP, il y a aussi eu des membres d'autres formations, d'autres fondations et nous sommes vraiment, vraiment ravis de nous dire que 90% des membres de la section viennent d'Afrique. Afrique. Et nous avons euh, eu une, 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 des plusieurs réunions et euh, au fil du temps, il y avait euh, de plus en plus de participants et 95% étaient venus d'Afrique. Il y a aussi l'Alliance pour la conservation des grands singes en Afrique centrale. Il y a également un réseau d'action d'Afrique de l'Ouest avec un de ses représentants qui est ici. Il y a aussi l'Alliance pour les grands singes. Il y a Enfin, et surtout la Fondation Arcus qui est le plus grand soutien pour ce qui est des grands singes. Nous travaillons ensemble au niveau local et international et cela nous a permis de faire beaucoup plus et de, nous, de, de, de contacter des bailleurs de fonds internationaux, des grandes organisations et nous avons créé un groupe de travail dont je vous en dirai dit plus, un petit peu plus. Nous voulons réduire, restaurer, euh, et d'ailleurs il y a un représentant ici, et donc nous avons un engagement collectif, ce qui fait que nous demandons à ce que toute entreprise demandant des prêts pour restaurer des habitats doive nous consulter. Cela permet de constituer un levier afin d'éviter la perte d'habitat ou bien d'éviter 
d'éviter ou de limiter l'impact des entreprises sur les habitats et sur les espèces sauvages. Cela a été rendu possible par notre collaboration. Nous travaillons bien sûr individuellement sur des projets séparés, mais nous travaillons également ensemble dans le domaine de la préservation des grands singes. Et cela nous permet d'avoir un impact considérable dans le domaine de la conservation des grands singes et de leurs habitats. Et cela reste un grand défi. Nous rencontrons une nouvelle difficulté toutes les semaines, tous les mois, mais non, nous sommes bien organisés, nous avons les moyens de relever les défis et nous sommes très heureux du travail mené par Sabrina. Nous travaillons très efficacement, nous le ferons à l'avenir, en tout cas je l'espère. Merci de votre attention. Hello everyone, I'm going to speak in French. Uh, I am Annette Lanjou. I represent uh, the Arcus Foundation, which is based in New York. And this is a foundation that finances different uh, conservation projects. And we are, as Ross said, the uh, major donor to finance uh, specifically conservation and protection efforts of great apes and small apes, gibbons, and salmons in Southeast Asia. We would like as well to back the motion that is very important, the motion to protect great apes and small apes, because we uh, want to include gibbons in the project, and the importance to back this network of different actors in Africa and in Asia in order to uh, support a large community of actors uh, for conservation of nature. The foundation, the Arcus Foundation puts about $14 million on the table every year behind conservation uh, and research for great apes everywhere in the world. We work in about 24 sites we back uh, a large number of organizations, but among others, uh, a number of various networks or alliances or NGO groups as well. And this is one of the major gaps in conservation. It's the effective collaboration between all these actors. That's why we back the planification, the joint planning of the be between all these actors to have an integrated ver vision of the conservation and really look at the needs on all sides, on all sides with different actors that must work together to remain not solely focused on our own specialty, but to really look on the side of the others to have a more holistic view of the conservation needs. So we support as Rus Medemeyer said, the uh, African Society of Primatology, the initiative uh, of Great Apes in Africa, the African Apes in Initiative, the consource, the uh, African Conservation Primatology for Conservation, and the Forina, which is the Forum Orangutan Indone of Indonesia, that work together to protect the orangutans in Asia. So this is very important for us to back this uh, various forums and collaborative initiatives. We are, of course, a major donor for the section on great apes and section on uh, small apes of the panelist panel of the IUCN. And this is for us the vision for the future to have a, a long-term impact on the conservation of great apes. So that's all I have to say. I, uh, I am delighted to see that the French government is supporting this initiative. Thank you very much. Hello, dear colleagues. It's a great honor for me to speak uh, today, and I will take you to a small journey. We start in 2019. The French government chaired the G7, and the point of this chair was to reinforce partnerships for the conservation of biodiversity. And I had the privilege 
to speak with the ministers at the G7 and to present as an example of partnership for conservation of biodiversity. And one of the recommendation of this meeting was to reinforce the international cooperation. Um, I don't have to explain to you what is GRASP. It's a partnership under the umbrella of the United Nations, the UNESCO, that uh, concentrates on the life of great apes. We have we have 107 partners, including govern governments, the donor uh, governments, scientists, NGOs, and the private sector. The next step after this meeting uh, to uh, look at this motion is to work with governments and the French committee of the IUCN and the partners that we have here uh, and the partners that uh, Anita brought, Annette mentioned already. It's to, we want to work on the international level and on the local level. I am in charge of the international part. Why is that important? because uh, we have several threats that the great apes face, the loss of habitat, traffic, illegal traffic, diseases. We already talked about the cooperation with the private sectors and banks, World Bank, the IFC. It's very important, but we also have a food crisis. Our production is not sustainable. We all know the uh, issue with palm oil and other products. But there's another aspect to it, another aspect to it. Very often, people live with wildlife and the great apes. There are no economic benefits for them, and uh, we need to. We all know the carbon credit. There's no carbon credit for the wildlife. So I really hope that one day we can talk to the communities who are in charge of wildlife. I just have a few minutes, so I think I'm going to stop on that little journey, but I would like to attract the French government to work with us on the next steps. We started with the G7, next uh, st uh, step is the G20 and the Economic Forum of Davos. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, to these reminders of the stakes that we are facing and for showing us that there are pro projects underway and that the goal is to work together. So now I would like to give the floor to the local actors who are going to give us their point of view on this proposal to try to establish a network of local actors that will work in the protected areas, but also outside of those protected areas, because as Johannes reminded us, there's an issue of consumption. And our consumption, when we talk about mobilizing all the actors, it's also about mobilizing all the actors here in their daily habits and to remember what's happening around those uh, protected areas. We have two witnesses, Jean-Paul Okima, who works for the... Um, and Jean-Paul Rezo, who's going to show us that there's uh, already... Jean-Paul, Jean if you want to join us, who works for Forest uh, Wildlife Population. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, as a local actor, um, en tant que acteur local, ma, mon idée sur cette nouvelle initiative qui consiste à réunir Just tous les acteurs locaux signifie que ça représente une chance unique as de salut pour ground, les grands singes. Uh, sur le terrain, on sait très bien qu'il y a beaucoup de petites initiatives sur le terrain, mais je me demande comment on pourrait avoir une seule vision et un seul plan commun. Donc je suis très excité à l'idée de cette initiative. Je pense que cette initiative va faire avancer l'ordre du jour des grands singes. Il s'agit de coopération et de réseau. Je pense que ce réseau va être une avenue 
venus pour nous, pour apprendre les uns des autres, pour échanger les uns avec les autres et pour travailler ensemble. Je pense également que cette initiative va réunir tous les acteurs locaux et toutes les petites associations sur le terrain. Ça va être un outil très puissant pour nous parce que la plupart d'entre eux, à mon avis, ils sont tous générés par la communauté. Ils ne sont pas à l'extérieur du système. Donc c'est notre l'occasion que nous avons d'embarquer tout le monde pour apprendre les uns des autres et pour faire avancer nos idées. Je suis très excité d'avoir plus d'idées et de faire progresser cette, cette, ce sujet. Donc je vous souhaite à tous une très bonne chance. Maintenant, Guillaume. Yeah. Guillaume Tati. Hello, I am Guillaume Tati. I am director for the uh, association Easy Congo that works on the protection of great apes and chimpanzees for the forest of Congo Brazzaville. And I am also chairing the Alliance for the Conservation of Great Apes in uh, Central Africa since 2019 which is a network of actors in uh, Central Africa that protects great apes from of the forest of Congo. So I'm going to talk about two points, uh, the uh, journey of the Alliance uh, network and the relevance of this type of network. On the journey, of course, I don't want to go back on the history and uh, we know that the local actors uh, work uh, in their landscapes uh, of force that shelter great concentrations of great apes, but that remained uh, anonymous for many years, which were not visible, which were not connected among each other, and uh, which would gravitate around the major uh, international NGOs, even though they are on the ground and produce results. So this assessment has taken us, uh, us little actor, to connect, to reach out through a donor, uh, which is the PPI, uh, to connect and have a, an assessment of what we are, what we're doing, our position, and how we could improve things. Improving things in two ways, e existing, uh, carry the voice, trying to say that we're here, we're legitimate, and we're legitimate, we have legitimacy to bring and contribute uh, more second element is also to find among each other to reinforce each other because we're a network of actors with seven actors at the moment from four uh, Gabon, Congo, uh, DC, RDC and, uh, and Cameroon. So several of us have experimented things uh, that are very innovating and it could be of use to the other countries. So this idea of uh, capacity building of the local actors is a dimension of the alliance. Third point is we need to have the political weight to support our decisions because we realize as a small actor, we of course are submitted to the decisions of conservation that are not working on the ground. So this is a chance to have a weight, a voice and to contribute and to be here at the moment where the big decisions are being made. So that's already what we're doing. So we're doing capacity building. Um, we work to on training programs to our members. There's also a very important uh, aspect of what we're doing is the relevance of the alliance. Already the alliance today has a strategic objective, which is to make sure that the small actors are vectors of good uh, associative governance on the ground because that's what will uh, support the work of uh, little acts, small actors and make them stronger. So we're trying to uh, support them and guide them. We need to connect them among each other. The, this network must be connected to the rest of the world. That's why this motion is so important for all of us, because we will be able to move on together. I think I should stop here because I think we're running out of time. Sabrina, I, uh, I hope that the motion will start. I think it's our roadmap uh, as of today. Let's not reproduce the mistakes of the past. Let's not the North represent the South. Once we're going to sign for this roadmap, we're going to have to agree on uh, work groups, work programs, and the local actors have to be there to tell 
everyone about their priorities because every square meter on the ground has to be um, represented by the local actors for sustainability. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Guillaume and John Paul, for the wisdom of your words. And today is the key day in this process. We carried the motion, and today uh, and this afternoon, the meeting that we'll have from two to four is really about passing on this uh, motion onto uh, the and give the local actors to take hold of this project. So let's hope that this afternoon uh, is fruitful. Guillaume, do you want to add something? I forgot to tell you that we have a few copies of our publications on Great Apes here, uh, some in French, and we have some copies in English uh, in the back of the room as well. So to wrap up, Paul will uh, give us a, a conclusion and a recap of this project. Paul, who uh, has been uh, really at the works of the motion and works for the French Committee of the IUCN. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for all your uh, interesting uh, presentations. They all show that we are all on board to protect uh, great apes and to prevent their disappearance. We tend to oppose uh, both approaches, international cooperation against local actors, but according to us, we should see it as uh, complementary approaches. It is very important that the major institutions get mobilized on the, dis on the disappearance of great apes but we wanted to propose this motion and associate the local actors to it, considering that the concept to imply local actors and mobilization of the social society is always used in the drafting of uh, any project. But often, in fact, the share of these actors in the decision-making uh, process and the local decisions remain very small. That's why with this motion, we ask for the, mo for the, the weight of local actors based on local NGOs, researchers, the indigenous population, the local communities on the image of the conservation of great apes, these networks could uh, get mobilized to uh, put in place some long-term studies on following the populations of great apes inside of the protected areas, but outside of those as well, implying the communities as well in the process. And we would like these communities or these actors to be uh, involved in the protection and the conservation of great apes. We need uh, to encourage the interaction between uh, local actors and uh, sharing of uh, knowledge. That's what will bring a collective answer to the disappearance of uh, great apes. All the efforts that have been made uh, by the graphs by this group of specialists, uh, now we really ask them to involve the networks in their decisions. We need to get the attention of financing to back these uh, local actors through uh, uh, any kind of uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, funding these local actors is a hope for the conservation of great apes and to carry out this mission. As we all uh, reminded each other, we will now call for the implementation of this uh, motion. The next step is this afternoon, trying to group uh, the local actors who are here with us at the Congress and also those uh, we try to reach out to as many as possible. We hope some of them will be online with us to make sure that this World Congress is a founding moment in the creation of uh, the network of local actors. Let's not forget that we also have to mobilize the private sectors and the donor banks to make sure that uh, they uh, promote uh, projects to protect the habitat of great apes. Let's not forget about the states that should put in place policies to fight against uh, 
trade uh, coming from deforestation and put an end to any illegal trafficking of species. So um, I will like to conclude by saying if we don't want to carry the responsibility of the disappearance of the seven species of this great family, it is absolutely fundamental to put our egos on the side or the contradictions between the states and the NGOs and various experts, and we really need to combine our efforts to save our cousins. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. I think that you uh, understand uh, the point of this uh, meeting of this morning. And uh, let's meet again in four years uh, to keep you updated on the progress of this uh, project. And thank you. A big thanks to the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs and to the French Pavilion for hosting us and to Mr. the Ambassador of France in Uganda for his uh, continual support, continuous support. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started. And now we are going to talk about the challenges in the field of biodiversity and uh, climate. I work uh, as a researcher in the field of climate, so we will focus on uh, research on studies and there are two international platforms you have already heard of the IPCC the Intergovernmental Panel of Experts on Climate Change and the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. I will use these acronyms, both acronyms, the IPBES and the IPCC very often and I will try uh, to not to use other acronyms. I would like to uh, thank the uh, Ministry for the Ecological Transition and the French Office for Biodiversity. We've been working together on uh, in the fields of biodiversity for a few years. And here, I am here with Elise Omeredi Thomas. She is a researcher in a research institute in Montpellier. She works on uh, the relationship between humankind and the environment. Uh, she uh, also works on, uh, on agro, uh, agroecology in the Mediterranean. She uh, has uh, contributed to the works carried out by the IPBES and to the international assessment that was published a few years ago. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, uh, this uh, report since it stated that one million species are threatened nowadays. And here is the focal point for the IPCC uh, on uh, my right. He, uh, he uh, wants uh, French experts to take part in the works of the IPCC to discuss the reports. And when he comes back uh, to uh, France, he uh, takes into account and uh, forwards the uh, recommendations uh, to the ministry. Today, we uh, want to uh, identify, to uh, understand how the research community has worked until now, and we want to know what we can do to find new solutions in order to preserve biodiversity. And here my first uh, question for uh, both of you, but uh, I think Elise uh, will, uh, can answer first. So this first question, is about the joint report published in June by the IPBES and the IPCC. It is the first time both platforms formally work together. Elise, what uh, does it mean? What does it imply for you? Are we entering a new era in the way we study biodiversity and climate? Will there be an impact on the way we draft uh, climate uh, uh, policies, biodiversity policies? As uh, will there be an impact, um, for example, in the huge uh, major conferences that will take place before the end of the year? Good morning, everyone. Uh, on one hand, 
there has been progress and i remember there was the uh, plenary assembly of the ipbs i think uh, the ipbs asked the ipcc to draft a joint report the french uh, delegation raised the awareness of top level ipcc uh, employees and representatives, uh, we have really promoted our voice and the IPCC answers Bay was frustrated at first because they uh, said that uh, uh, their work plan is defined every five years and uh, we cannot add up anything in the meantime. So we uh, were really uh, wondering uh, what would be the uh, reaction of the uh, our colleagues at the IPBS. Uh, they could have taken this answer uh, for uh, uh, sheer arrogance, and they just said that uh, there, there was a, a work plan, that uh, all countries agreed on this work plan. There are 274 countries working in the IPCC. If one doesn't agree with the report, then it cannot be adopted. And there were 34 elected scientists. They said they could do something, and that was uh, quite an achievement. So we managed uh, uh, to uh, work towards this report. On a scientific point of view, this report conveys very interesting uh, messages, and now we uh, need uh, to uh, take these messages and to promote them uh, in the uh, climate uh, debate. However, the IPCC didn't really publicize the report when it was published because some member countries of the IPCC were opposed to the report. Consequently, the IPCC didn't make any promotion for this report. This report has got a political value for the uh, uh, climate, uh, for the climate uh, COP. It, it, it has a political value. So. What can I say? Uh, my uh, position is quite ambivalent. There is some uh, positive uh, element and some negative elements. Thank you very much. So you have a, a very specific point of view because you are present at the plenary assembly. You see member countries discussing documents. So Elise, what's your reaction? You're a researcher. You work on the connection between climate and biodiversity. So I hope you do have more freedom in your everyday uh, work, but do, are you, do you feel you're part of these silos? Uh, personally, I don't, I'm not subjective to this uh, silo structure, but to come back to the IPBS, it is true that the uh, Global Nature Report that was published in 2019 in Paris, this report has uh, listed all the factors that uh, uh, have the highest impact on biodiversity, among these uh, factors, there is obviously land use and more specifically land use system. Secondly, a loss of species. Climate is the third factor only. However, the whole IPBES community is convinced uh, that this uh, climate factor will soon be, will soon hold the first place in this classification because there is a, a, a difference between the IPBS and the IPCC. Indeed, the IPBS tackles the question of biodiversity that is living organism uh, elements we can uh, manage. And the IPBS also uh, tackles the well-being of humankind. Consequently, what could a support and reinforce the relationship between the IPBES and the IPCC? Well, maybe we could uh, we could make a triangle and make a connection between biodiversity and humankind and the well-being of humankind, so that we can find sustainable long-term solution. 
Thank you very much. You made a great transition to another question I wanted to ask. What about traditional knowledge, a local community, traditional knowledge? These communities are subjected to change, are affected by change. As an anthropologist, you work uh, quite uh, close to the Mediterranean uh, communities. You uh, know their, uh, you know them well. So, what are the interactions that we can have between biodiversity and local communities? Is biodiversity an asset to fight climate change, or is biodiversity another barrier uh, to bring down? Here, I cannot speak on the behalf of um, local uh, Mediterranean local communities. As you know, the Mediterranean is a, a climate change hotspot. It is also a uh, hotspot on the social dimension when uh, we speak about globalization or international conflicts. Consequently, we need to have a broad picture of the Mediterranean there are issues to solve in the Mediterranean. For example, most of its population is on the shore of uh, the, the Mediterranean, which means that they are very vulnerable to extreme weather events. Furthermore, the temperature level, the temperature rise could drastically change Mediterranean agriculture. There are many uh, olive trees in the region. They could be severely affected by climate change. The Mediterranean is a hotspot uh, for uh, maritime, for shipping, is a, a significant hub for shipping. There are many ships traveling around. Everything is connected. The Mediterranean is a, a lab laboratory in between the land and the sea. And we need to work on local scales with local communities as the Mediterranean has many cultural reaches. It is one of a, a significant herb for plants and wildlife. There's a rich agriculture, a great uh, food diversity, and everything is changing at a rapid pace. So we cannot uh, work with local communities separately. It, they have to be part of the broader picture. Obviously, there are uh, many practices who are being uh, lost and some in the family uh, agriculture is disappearing and uh, agriculture shifting from family uh, businesses to uh, industrial businesses. Uh, let's think about, let's take uh, a olive trees in Southern Spain. That's what's happening. They're shifting towards uh, industrial agriculture, and there is a major shift here. Uh, our politicians have a responsibility, and we are lucky enough to have the Union for the Mediterranean. I hope they will act, but we cannot only uh, only count on uh, local communities. They have a, a lot of knowledge, but they, this is not sufficient to uh, change things. So we talk now about uh, solutions uh, and uh, to look at uh, different scale because we're looking at the local scale that citizens, uh, farmers, uh, at uh, the IPCC or the IPBS, we have an idea of these uh, transformation, both platforms name them differently. In both cases, it calls for a revamping of our way of looking at economical, social factors, the very values that are uh, at the foundation of our society. Do you think that it would be a way to look at the situation? Uh, Ines said it's not enough. Eric, you said that uh, climate, uh, the climate policies 
or the biodiversity uh, stakes don't have enough visibility for the next uh, COP for the climate. So these uh, very important changes will it lead to including those stakes of biodiversity and climate. Uh, behind this notion, uh, you could put as many interpretations as uh, different people. It, they are all new concepts. You don't find in the report from the IPCC Group 1, it's the first volume that is uh, on geophysical aspects. We'll find more in the report from Group 2. There was this idea of a client uh, resilience pathway, so uh, it's a different name, but that's what it means. And the report from Group 3 that will focus, published in March, that will focus more on the uh, social economic pathways of uh, humankind to respect the boundaries of uh, the climate, uh, of the global warming. So the report from Group 1 uh, underlies the the conditions that not to go over 1.5 degree and the pathways in terms of emissions and methane and other gas that these have consequences on biodiversity i'm not talking about impacts but what the ipcc says they don't say that uh, we should uh, have negative emissions, but they say that the pathway at the, with the level of concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that is there, because no matter what we do, the next 20 years are already called for. We've seen this with the COVID crisis. We reduced our emissions by 7% and the atmosphere has not noticed it in terms of greenhouse uh, gas emissions in terms of temperature. We even had some record high uh, of heat last year. So on those negative emissions, it's a, it's an important topic. It so could lead to confusion on the relationship between climate and biodiversity. It's not because the IPCC says that the pathway of CO2 that will allow us to respect this 1.5 degree have a big have a recourse to negative um, emissions that we need to plant some monocultures or transform some lands for food safety uh, to stock some carbon there's nothing of the sort in the IPCC message. The authors of the IPCC and the members of the Bureau would like to say that the solution is not here, but the solution is to reduce even more our, emission, our emissions and to change the whole paradigm. The world as it is uh, today is incompatible with a climate that would get stabilized in the near future. There's nothing we can do about that. They would like to pass messages to the decision makers, but they don't have the right to because they're uh, an intergovernmental uh, organization. But it's not because they're not allowed to do it that we can't read behind the lines, that that's their message. And uh, they're suggesting the NGOs and the governments to uh, carry these messages. So we couldn't, it would, there was nothing worse than solving the climate issue by uh, destroying the last resource that we have. The, any climatologist knows that the concentration of greenhouse emission is a problem of cycle of the carbon, of the uh, nitrogen and without uh, the vegetation and ecosystems, they, the ecosystems are those who regulate all those exchanges. Thank you for your testimonial. It's very honest uh, from your part. Um, uh, what you're saying about the intergovernmental platform, Ines, uh, who you are more on the IPBS side, do you think there's more freedom 
for from what I know, they have a more diverse approach, maybe, uh, since the IBES is uh, taking into account the, the policies, politicians, societies, uh, values, uh, the IBES uh, has an easier time to, uh, it's easier for this platform to make uh, recommendations. And with the models at the scale of the landscape, for example, uh, to have more agroecology, uh, to have a better management of resources, but it still remains at the stage of uh, recommendations to the member states. And it, it is then up to the member states to decide on the way they're going to implement these recommendations. And that's very complex. On the uh, issue of uh, pollinization, we know that it's a factor that is very important that can be affected by climate change. But the ozone can affect uh, the, the pollinization process. And practically, at the scale of uh, member states, it is up to them to decide. There's a level of constraints that is not so easy for us as experts. And we are really wondering if we shouldn't have a new report of the IPBS and come up with new recommendation because the end solution, this is not the end solution. And the political world should really uh, have a strong uh, positioning on that. I don't know the constraint mechanisms, but I feel there are not any of those. There are not m many of those. Yes, we're looking at independent bodies. Uh, these are not treaties. These are not legal uh, devices, legal instruments. And as you said, it is then up to the states to take things in their hands. Eric, you were saying that we don't know what's behind this notion. Uh, should we have another report? The IPBS has launched a report on dedicated on that issue of transformative changes. Uh, let's try to uh, support many actors. It was uh, states, of course, but the private sector, the communities, uh, the, the stakeholders. So we can hope that with these orientations, uh, we'll achieve uh, an integrated approach on climate and biodiversity. I also want to say that the Foundation for Biodiversity is holding a meeting on the 30th of September. If you're interested to know more about that, we're trying to open the door to the works of the IPBS and analyze it with the French uh, scientists and researchers. You can join us online or in, perf in person in Paris. So I think uh, we can have a quick uh, exchange with the room. If there are questions uh, in the room, if you have questions for Eric, I wanted to know between the IPCC and the IPBS, is does the IPBS have the same weight than the IPCC in terms of political decisions? Is it going to have the same weight than the IPCC? Let's say that the IPBS is a younger platform uh, between science and politicians. So it's less well known, but the IPBS w functions the same way than the IPCC because the IPBS is in close link with the Convention for Biodiversity, 
which which uh, repeats uh, the same uh, ideas than the report from the IPBS. So there's a real connection between both. The platform may not be uh, connected in the same way than the IPCC, but it has its uh, history with the climate convention. There's a fundamental difference it's the fact that since we have the Paris Agreement, which is uh, really uh, within the UN Convention for Climate Change, we could see a few countries expressing their position towards the IPCC because they now measure the power of that. And it's going to be the same with the IPBS if there's a major agreement uh, that is as strong as the Paris Agreement, we'll see that some governments will do all they can to mitigate the messages that the scientists are trying to produce. We saw that with the Paris Agreement, the IPCC had produced a, a special report on the global warming of 1.5 degrees. It was a nightmare to approve line by line for some countries that wanted to limit and reduce uh, the, the message. So it's a negotiation between governments, but it's also uh, each message uh, uh, and the report. The authors of the report have to all agree on every sentence on the report. So there's several blocks of governments, uh, two major blocks. There's those who want to avoid any uh, message on fossil fuels and the other block that wants to reduce emissions and be and there's also the authors of the report who carry the scientific message so nearly every time we manage to uh, have uh, uh, a common message or recommendation the the IPCC does not have the right to make recommend recommendation they can be policy prescriptive um, so we have to find uh, sentences uh, that say uh, such uh, thing could lead to that. Uh, but if you know how to read behind the lines, it's uh, complicated. And when you see how some countries are tensing up, particularly oil producing countries against the uh, IPCC reports, there were some, uh, you know, a question mark on do we continue to do that or not? Even if we're very frustrated by uh, what's happening, if there weren't some uh, some uh, real messages, fundamental messages behind, we would be lacking a tool to act properly. Hello, uh, thank you. I am uh, elected uh, with the uh, Greater Paris Region authorities. Uh, well, next to the reports from the IPCC and many institutions, we want to uh, act and we're getting a bit lost in the complexity of the red tape and all the information that we are receiving. We would like to act concretely on a daily basis but we really need to have uh, some guidance. Is it uh, something that uh, you will be doing? Some uh, very simple, concrete uh, guidance so we don't get lost in the mass of information that we receive. We also have a role to uh, reassure the population because if we're too um, negative and pessimistic, uh, we will worry them. On this point, uh, I can say a quick word. The IPBS and the IPCC are at uh, such a macro level that they don't have the means to transform this dialogue uh, into guidance for the actors and local communities. We hear it also from companies who say, what does it mean for my company? at the Foundation for the Research on Biodiversity, we play this role to articulate the message at different scales. We don't work yet with local uh, communities, but at least maybe you, as a researcher, uh, you can say something. 
Yes, I want to repeat that at the IPBS uh, scale, we don't have the means to do some mediations with communication messages. And there's some real um, jobs that need to be created within the ministries in France because uh, there is a need to uh, communicate and that will allow us to move down to the territorial throughout the territorial network as a researcher at the CNRS I work on a local scale on uh, local knowledge of communities uh, particularly uh, I work in Lozère, Ardèche and our works that are based on synergies between science and local know-how, ancestral know and traditional uh, know-how that are not part of the industrial process. Those uh, works, we make sure that we co-construct them with the people own this uh, know-how and also with all the key actors in the territories, including the politicians in monitoring committees in order to uh, get uh, the feedback for these results very quickly and and share it with the, the decision makers. Because if we choose to have a very committed research on uh, co-construction, we're not going to put forward the scientific publication, but more the transmission of know-hows of uh, stakeholders. So as researchers, depending on where we stand, we want to bring a message, but we don't have the capacity, we don't have people to do the communication uh, work. Eric, uh, I don't know if you want to say something. I read uh, a letter f uh, to the, the senators. Uh, yes, we call it tri uh, quarterly letter to the elected uh, authorities. I would like to greet my uh, Florence, who's uh, the municipal uh, Councillor, we live in the same town and I know uh, what this town is doing in terms of reducing speed to reduce the emissions. I think uh, the uh, elected uh, people have a real role to play. It's not easy to read by the average citizen, but uh, a lot of them, you know, don't understand. So there has to be a way to look into the reports um, the so for the solutions or the different leads to reduce uh, emissions because I'm more on the climate side. It's the real uh, treasure, you know, of course it's written by scientists, so it's uh, always a bit complex, complicated to understand. But it's and it's the fruit of negotiation. So I understand that all the scientists who contributed to these reports uh, can be mobilized. The authors themselves, of course, uh, there are probably hundreds of them uh, for reports, and ten of them are probably in France. And uh, they looked at works from other colleagues who are people who uh, can be mobilized. So it's it's not that clear cut uh, to find the, the the guidance, but if you uh, read, you know their answer. These are scientists who will probably uh, orientate you or guide you to some colleagues in certain regions. Uh, people like uh, Hervé Le Treux, who's uh, from Paris, but he's often quoted as a reference on works in Nouvelle-Aquitaine, which is the Bordeaux uh, region, and the way of uh, how this uh, region has to uh, get prepared for all the uh, environmental challenges. So I think it's a very uh, complicated decision, but it's really the uh, elected officials who uh, 
will have to uh, mobilize their population, the population that they represent, and find some resources. I'm not sure if you know that uh, there's a convention, Citizen Convention for the Climate. These are people who do an incredible work uh, to spread uh, the results, circulate the, the results of the research. So we need to have this Citizen Convention for Biodiversity. I'm going to take a last question if uh, nobody uh, objects. Good morning. I am Mathilde Dory of the French Office for Biodiversity. I have a plan to merge the Convention about Biodiversity and Climate Change. Will there be a merger of the IPBS and the IPCC? There have been a plan, a work plan for the production of a joint reports. So have you talked about it? And uh, you uh, mentioned that the transformation we need for biodiversity and climate are often the same. So uh, could we actually uh, think about a ministerial letter that would combine biodiversity and climate change? Or can we integrate biodiversity in the high level council for climate are you uh, know more about the ministry can you answer so my uh, uh, colleagues from uh, various ministries will be a little bit would be in a better position to uh, provide you with an answer. So I don't think this will happen, but that's my personal point of view. Some colleagues have come to me and um, talked about and mentioned the idea, and I'm always sad to tell them that uh, it's impossible because I know how much time it takes sometimes to agree on a simple sentence. I've discussed this possibility with a few colleagues when, and you know, when we create this a convention, there's a momentum, there are many possibilities, many perspectives, but once it's there, it is a very complex mechanism, the UN complex mechanism. This mechanism can lead to many possibilities, but can also uh, create many uh, obstacles. So. That's also the case in the Security Council of the uh, UN. There are uh, there are difficult, there are challenges. So I don't think uh, the two conventions will merge. However, I do uh, think they could work together. There could be some uh, national avenues for collaboration. Because in uh, this, in that case, you don't need the agreement of the validation of all the countries present. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of the session. Uh, however, we do believe we could work closer together in the future. We're convinced we will. Thanks for your proposal. Thank you, everyone, for your attention, for your questions. And now we're going to talk about rewilding. Good morning. Thank you for attending this session. We're going to talk about the rewilding or the ecological revitalization of territories from ecological functions to coexistence issues. We want to talk about several concepts, rewilding, renaturation, return to nature. So we will talk about uh, their meaning, uh, what is at stake, and we want to understand how these actions can reduce the loss of biodiversity and help restore ecosystems and maintain ecosystem services rendered to our societies. And today, will we hear two, our two guests. First of all, Mr. Francois Sarrazin. He works at the Sorbonne University. He is a member of the Scientific Council of the French Research on Biodiversity Institute. 
we will also hear the take of one of our colleagues, Natalie Petroli. She works for the Institute of Zoology of London. She is now in London, uh, online, live. Thank you for being here, Natalie. And now Natalie will uh, tell us about rewilding. She will talk about the works uh, carried out uh, by a, a specific group implemented by the IUCN. They produced a rewilding motion that it will be uh, th th that adopted a motion uh, here, and this working group will be uh, working on rewilding to the IUCN in the future. And then Natalie will supplement her speech and she will work about, she will talk about the conservation efforts carried out in France and in Europe and she will talk about the ethics challenges uh, emphasized by uh, rewarding. So, um, after the uh, intervention of our guest speakers, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. You can even do it online. So, Natalie has prepared a short video because we weren't really sure that uh, we'd have a good connection. So we're going to launch this video and stay connected with Natalie. Please launch the Hello. video. Uh, my name is Natalie Petrelli. I'm a senior scientist at the Zoological Society of London. And today I'm going to talk to you about rewilding. I'm very sorry I couldn't make it uh, in person uh, to this session but hopefully you'll get a, a good taste of uh, what I wanted uh, to share with you today. Um, so the title of my talk is, to, is Defining Rewilding, a challenge for the upcoming IUCN Working Group on Rewilding. But let's start first by um, uh, talking about the pressing issue, which is uh, um, the two global intertwined environmental crises that we have to tackle, and I mean the climate change emergency and the biodiversity loss crisis. And these two environmental crises very much interact um, and are going at rates uh, much faster than originally anticipated. So, so what are the solutions? Well, one um, low cost, low maintenance, low risk approach is to bet on nature and um, to uh, focus on um, uh, ecological restoration. Um, and uh, nature protection. So there's multiple ways to do this. We, we can go for landscape and seascape protection. Uh, we can uh, increase um, and, and make the environmental standard stronger. We can focus on restoration. And uh, more recently, um, there's been more and more talk about uh, trying rewilding approaches. Um, so what's rewilding? So originally, um, the concept was uh, a link to uh, those three C, uh, cores, carnivores and corridors. So this was basically um, referring to approaches that would focus on carnivore conservation in big, large core areas, well connected. But since uh, the 80s, when uh, that, that concept first emerged, it has been um, uh, becoming more and more uh, diverse and a number of them uh, definitions have appeared, uh, which um, have um, enlarged the concept to not just carnivore, but um, a, a lot of different types of species, um, and that uh, have not systematically focused on large scale conservation. Um, as such, there's been multiple types of uh, rewilding um, that have emerged. So, for example, there's been a uh, discussion around place to scene rewilding, which is about bringing back equivalent community assemblage to those uh, found in the place to scene. So, really, um, a focus on megafauna. There's been a, a talk of uh, passive rewilding, which is basically linked to land abandonment in Europe, where um, nature slowly comes back on its own term in areas that are not used anymore um, by communities. There's been a talk of trophic rewilding, 
which really focus on restoration of trophic interaction and, and general ecological rewilding, which, uh, which is broader and look at ecological processes as a well. whole. What has been clear over the past few years is that the level of discussion uh, around rewilding and what it is has really increased and more and more people um, um, agree that we need to agree um, and really uh, start to have a clear definition of what rewilding are and provide guidelines as to how uh, this should be done. And so uh, recently, two years ago, a motion was um, uh, sponsored by the Zoological Society of London together with another a, a number of other organizations to ask the IUCN to create an intercommissional uh, working group that is a, a working group that represents all the IUCN commission to uh, agree on a definition and produce guidelines on uh, rewilding. Now that motion was supported and uh, um, it is about to become effective uh, now at uh, the World Congress in Marseille. So rewilding, even though um, is not um, there's no real agreement on what it is, it's, it's really is uh, becoming more and more common on the ground. So a lot of projects are being implementing, implemented in Europe, but also in South America, North America is slowly coming in Australia, and so with some discussion in Asia. And you may wonder why people engage so much with um, which that concept and why there is so much discussion around it. I think the, the overall consensus is that um, there, there are some exciting uh, uh, conceptual development associated with rewilding. The first of all is the fact that uh, contrary to restoration, which would probably focus a bit more on bringing back what was there, uh, rewilding kind of accept that things can't be the same uh, or can't stay the same. So this, this acceptance that nature is dynamic in changing all the time. And as such, it really opens up some form of discussion around novel ecosystems. So the emergence of ecosystem that may have not happened before or uh, occurred before. There's also <clears throat> a focus is on processes and functionality with rewilding. Um, um, but despite all the different uh, definitions, that, that one of the commonality is this focus on uh, making nature works better. Uh, not, so not just a, a focus on a single species. And it really embraces unpredictability and the lack of control. Another common theme around all those definitions in discussion is the importance put on uh, low uh, management. Um, so low, low level of uh, intervention and, and basically letting nature do its thing. Um, because uh, rewilding has this element of unpredictability, it really put at the forefront the issue and the importance of tackling the, 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 the problem of coexistence between uh, um, human development and nature conservation. Um, and so therefore acknowledges that this is not an ecological discussion, but it's a socio-ecological uh, system that we're talking about. So the importance of really taking into account people when talking about rewilding. There are, there are however, a, a number of tension points. And uh, so one of them being, for example, how does rewilding differ from restoration? If the two are the same, there's been a long uh, strand of research and agreement on what restoration is and how it should be done. And so if it's a simple repackaging, then, then there's no point continuing to talk about rewilding. So establishing the difference between the two is quite important. There's also tension around uh, how large should a rewilded area be. So um, can you do rewilding at all spatial scales? Or does it have to be at large scale? Um, other tension around um, uh, people's interaction with rewilded sites, so whether they should be open to, it, to, to uh, people, whether people could uh, uh, live in those areas, whether they should be completely excluded from rewilded area. And then there's this real discussion as to what is wild nature, as of what, what would you consider acceptable? in terms of a composition or similarity to historical benchmark, um, whether novel ecosystem or wild or not, and whether ecosystem without large predator, for example, can be considered wild. 
other tangent point or about monitoring success this is a relatively new concept and as such there's no real agreement on how do you uh, know whether your rewilding project is working or not and how do you deal with risk and um, that could uh, uh, be both in terms of um, a health risk to uh, animals in rewilded site and and risk uh, to the communities that live nearby rewilded site and then there's some discussion around and tension around uh, the integration of rewilding with an existing policy framework, um, which tend to be for the moment still for very much focused on composition as opposed to processes. And that's an important ar argument because if you don't fix the legislation, then um, the, the scope for developing more rewilding uh, sites becomes very narrow. I hope that this presentation has given you a, a bit of an, uh, um, an idea of, of, of where we are at in terms of rewilding and really looking at some of the challenges that the working group will have uh, to tackle, basically addressing all those tensions and finding consensus uh, by producing um, a, a documents and definition that, that uh, most people see merit with and, and can endorse. I would really um, I'd love to answer any question you may have on this, but also uh, say that if this is something that interests you or, or want to hear more, uh, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and uh, I hope that everybody uh, followed this video. And now I turn towards uh, Mrs. Mr. Sarazan. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for supporting me. I will uh, now uh, supplement uh, maybe what uh, Natalie said. But first of all, let me uh, confirm there is a continuity, a momentum. Uh, uh, you know, there are uh, many uh, disruptions uh, at uh, the uh, level of wild species uh, as defined by the IUCN. There are concepts such as ecological substitution. There are many concepts that have been studied and have been subjected to feasibility studies in order to restore a population in the long run, in the long term. So we now we speak about long-term biodiversity. It is a species-based approach. There are other a, a convergent approaches about restoration with a uh, with a, what are the targets of restoration. So we need to identify our targets, and our targets are usually based on local communities. But there are so many uh, open questions. Do we have to restore this ecosystem the way they were? Should we restore them as they should be to face the future challenges. And uh, now uh, emerges there's a rewilding a concept. And we're still working on the definition. Here is a, a draft of the definition that raises a, a several questions that makes a connections between how and how and why. So that's why I would like to. Uh, I will come back to ethics issues. Uh, I think they're important. So here uh, now we are at the uh, French uh, pavilion and uh, we cannot really uh, uh, take the national debate as an example of what's going on at the level, at the national level. So France has many responsibilities in the field of biodiversity, but in uh, some uh, French territories, a bubble in on mainland France, there uh, are uh, there uh, there are many questions raised. Uh, we need to take uh, agriculture into account. Some uh, specific landscape are the uh, target a restoration project. There's more and more fragmentation in uh, um, in in urban areas, and there is also there are so many uh, questions. Uh, being uh, raised about ecological uh, processes. We want them to work. We want uh, species uh, to be maintained in the long term. 
and these are questions raised in many uh, in many areas Consequently, the, uh, some species have returned to the natural areas. Uh, we have identified them. Some uh, partners of mine reintroduced vultures. They restore specific function, recycling functions in uh, different uh, areas. And these approaches uh, were supported by a species-based approaches in the 70s. We wanted to return species to where they lived before. Similar uh, programs are being translated in a rewilding circumstances, rewilding project. There's so many uh, such species in uh, Europe, and this goes for uh, animals or plants. In this past 50 years, we've, we've seen more and more uh, such uh, programs, especially for uh, birds, but there are also uh, other animals uh, that were uh, returned. And the uh, choice of species was uh, adjusted to the, the, the area, the uh, relevant area. So what about rewilding in France? So we use this word in France, rewilding. So we talk a lot about it. There's a debate now. Uh, there uh, we uh, talk in French. So the literal translation would be return to the wild, to wildlife. Uh, so there is a controversy about rewilding. But on the other hand, there's a growing interest for rewilding, we want nature to be taken into uh, consideration, nature, but also wilderness. And uh, there is a concept that is an emerging concept here in France. We raise uh, several questions. We want to turn towards spontaneous processes. And in France, we uh, insist on the free involvement. I will come back to that later. It is based on ecological processes with energy and material flows within ecosystem. As I was saying, there's a great interest for rewilding among uh, NGOs, regional, local association. They don't know what approach they should adopt. And local actors were in charge of rewilding until now. There are collectivities, municipalities, and the media is active and now uh, raises the question of rewilding. There, there, there are labels, there's Im labels are emerging, there are experiments being carried out, NGOs are carrying experiments. One NGO has bought an area to carry out experiment. So let, now let's talk about the pressure on nature, as the IPBS uh, uh, put it. There are direct pressures uh, driven by indirect pressures that is the uh, functioning of our society with a different dynamics who can be conflicting. However, there are also values. Each time there's a restoration, there are values. So now let's open the debate about values because rewilding has disrupted our benchmark, our con the connections we had between a biocentric, anthropocentric, or ecocentric levels. And now let me mention some uh, works I've been carrying out with Paris Saclay University. We want to turn to the uh, concept of uh, a restoration of rewilding, but based on the history of the living organism, taking into account spontaneous processes that have evolved uh, throughout history, including our own evolution, cultural, historical evolution as humankind. We must remember we've got a uh, common roots with animals when it comes to evolution. 
So when we talk about rewarding, we must uh, we must determine what we want to do. Should we continue the instrumentation? Are our uh, challenges and targets are to uh, to centers on ourselves? Because when we think about climate change, we uh, first think about ourselves so we use the issue of biodiversity to reach our own uh, targets or uh, should uh, we uh, should we consider that nature is important to take pictures to have a walk is it just is nature just having a walk having a nice landscape or should we take living organism into account and scale take them into account and just do do we need to go beyond ourselves so that's when we should wonder should we leave some uh, more space to the wild but there's a uh, there's another question so we should should we focus on the future of living organisms to put it before our own interest that would be a great evolution and this shows that rewilding wouldn't be going doesn't mean we're going backwards we are just questioning our impact and we are trying to drive and to drive environment that is true we're trying to affect it change it but we do it to give other living organisms the chance to survive it is obvious that rewilding has one asset because it puts on the table this issue the issue of our relationship to the rest of the living uh, organisms and there uh, there is some immediate connections with uh, climate change issues but beyond climate change we must uh, uh, talk about ethics at the local regional and international level so that we can take collective decisions and so we can see that local territories that turn towards rewarding are innovative and that's my main message today we're not going backwards those are territories where human beings for the first time accept to lose control and to give control to nature so this kind of processes may already be present in other uh, cultures but we are entering a new area and it is really interesting thank you thank you francois thank you natalie um, i had prepared a, a few questions for our speakers uh, but if i want to leave uh, time uh, for the public I will keep, I will save my questions for later and we'll see if some of those uh, would like to ask a question in the room. Hello, I wanted to ask a question. Is this change uh, of uh, mindset that is necessary to move on and to uh, reach this uh, progress uh, and rewilding? Do you think that the traditions of hunting and uh, the way of uh, forest management traditions are not major blocking points that should be addressed? in a very uh, aggressive way by giving the possibility to think about uh, nature in a wild way again and not as uh, being used by men. Nathalie, do you I'll, want to I'll, answer? Yeah, I'll do that in English, sorry, because uh, I, I can hear the translator as I talk. Um, I, I would say that rewilding isn't there to remove everything else. 
or to move from one strategy to another. It's a complementary approach. It won't work everywhere. It won't work for everyone. The idea here is to identify where it could work and where people are ready to work with nature to accept a rewilding approach. So this is not about forcing people to change completely everywhere, whatever they do. This is about a negotiation so that we can actually move together in area where people are ready for it and are ready to do this. Another question. Uh, you have a translation in English, if I understand correctly, for both of you. You talked about ethics. Uh, I'd like to go back on that uh, by taking the example of the pre-Anthropocene uh, rewild. Uh, where do we put the boundary here? Uh, do we uh, prepare the future as you presented it? Do we want to reintroduce species that disappeared? Francois, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, it's a very uh, big debate here. There are many uh, arguments, pros and cons, from an environmental point of view, from an evolution point of view, if we want to restore old things. We could also uh, mention the project of de-extinguishing, um, de-extinction projects. If we want to uh, have uh, an evolution perspective again, if the idea is to give a chance to the evolution chain, is to have interactions in which the bodies uh, cohabited, coexisted. But of course, things change with time, and the more we go back in history, the less chance we have to restore these interactions. Um, it would be having uh, environmental replacements. It's being discussed in some circles, but it raises very, uh, very big questions. Anthropic impacts have happened. The issue is not to say, let's pretend as if men never existed. It's about seeing if we can change our pathway with what is we have left. Uh, if we can give a chance again to the wild nature to give it its autonomy. It doesn't mean without any interaction again, but with levels of interaction that would not be directly steering the uh, pathway of the ecosystems and the systems. Can we uh, let go and uh, not try to uh, uh, manage the world and as we used to? Hello, uh, Kimberly Fanger, Animal Cross. I have a question uh, on the implementation of these areas of rewilding. How can it be achieved and how can you ensure to have these areas of rewilding and so they're not being disturbed by intrusive or extractive activities from men? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Francois. Um, I think this is exactly the type of question that the rewilding working group uh, will be faced with when developing guidelines on rewilding, as well as an agreed definition on what rewilding is. The, the contexts are hugely different. The guidelines and the definition that we're going to need to produce need to work everywhere, not just in Europe, where we have some form of issue, but also in Australia, in South Africa and Africa in general, in Asia, where the, those contexts, the socioeconomic context and the culture and the way um, the relationship works with nature are completely fundamentally different. So um, I'm sorry, I can't give you the answer you would like because I think it's going to be tricky. But this is exactly the type of question that we're going to need to, um, to address now. Okay, I'm going to stick to French then. Um, the big question here uh, is uh, the means and the end, and the end goal and the means that we're willing to use to achieve the goal. And it's not just specific to rewilding. It, there's a confusion sometimes between the end goal and the means that we have. Because if we don't agree on what the goal that we want to achieve, we are arguing about the means that we're going to use to get there. But let's first agree on the end goal. 
A last question, because then uh, we'll have to uh, leave the floor to the next session. Thank you. Um, yes, on the goals, when you talk about the end goal that you want to achieve, what is your point of view on the targets? What are the targets? Can we have a non-biased uh, targets so we can uh, support those rewilding programs? Maybe, what do you mean by uh, non-biased, non-prejudiced uh, goals? Well, I mean, uh, no, non-twisted by a human bias. It's to be objective, yes. Uh, I don't mean it necessarily uh, with a human intervention, but I mean, uh, Natalie can probably uh, answer that. The definition of the final goals, the rewilding brings this function and dimension that is very important. We're getting out of a species by species approach. Even we can have a, a species approach to to work with that as well. What I wanted to add in terms of the evolution dimension is do we think about functions, certain functions more than others, uh, for example, storage issues of carbon, in face of uh, the climate challenges, it's a real problem. If we're looking at just reducing our evolution footprint, we want to neutralize uh, the arbitrage and want to give more chance to uh, nature and the organism that compose it. I just want to say that the, the remember that uh, you can't have the same target everywhere. These, whenever you start a rewilding project, you start it with a specific community that is able to go in in, in some degree into where they want to. So there is there is a, dif a difference between uh, a global view on what rewilding could achieve and where it could go. And then there is the actual local tailoring of what's happening so that people are happy with that. Because uh, you can't you can't do the same everywhere, and people are not prepared to go uh, uh, to the same extent everywhere. So this is what I was trying to say in my presentation. It finally opens up to the platform for a negotiation, so that you go from overall goal and vision to an actual tailoring to specific condition to work with people and community that will have to work with a, a rewilding project nearby. And maybe a last word, I think that there's a pedagogical value, the way we change our view, our vision on the spaces and the habitat around us, even very small habitat, they're going to let be wild again. So we can uh, be aware of uh, pr the process before. That's the key thing. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Uh, thank you to Francois and Nathalie for their uh, speeches and uh, have a nice end of a Congress to all of you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here with you to moderate this roundtable on the theme companies and research. What a partnership can we find for the restoration of ecosystems for this roundtable? I asked two major French groups to be here, CMA, CM, uh, CGM, it's a company uh, that is a world leader in maritime transport, and the national company of Rhone, which uh, manages the river of the Rhone and plays a major role in energy transition. Those two companies will tell us how within their perimeters they put in place research program to protect and restore biodiversity that is aff affected by human activity. And also we'll talk about research and financing with uh, the INRE, the National Institute for Research and Agriculture and Food and Environment, and also a bank, BNP Paribas, which finances, among other projects, pro programs implying companies. And we'll see what are the eligibility criteria that the bank has to finance such operations. So before we uh, start with this roundtable and give the floor to each speaker so they can introduce themselves, after each presentation, we will 
have a few minutes for questions. At the end, we will wait for everybody to speak first, and then we'll address questions. So I'll give the floor to Claire Martin, who will introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your invitation. I am Claire Martin. I am a manager of uh, the CSR of the group CMA CGM, a major actor of maritime transport and logistics. Hello. Okay. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, Franck Precia, I'm in charge of the Environment Department at CNR. CNR is a company that uh, is uh, working with the, managing the, the River Rhone from Switzerland to the Mediterranean to develop nav uh, transport and also help agriculture with also another assignment for a few years to steer and manage environmental actions for the biodiversity of the river. Jean-Philippe Nabot, uh, I am a regional delegate for INRAE. INRAE is the National Institute for Research. The main re, um, mission is to uh, provide a healthy food system based on a sustainable environment. And that leads to uh, researches that I will get into more details. Astrid, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I think uh, we can hear you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Astrid Beagel, uh, I am a Director for Investment uh, at BNP Paribas. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, I uh, want to thank our speakers. My name is Marc Navasta. I am a Research Director and also I am the Regional Delegate for the region, in for research and innovation for the region Provence Côte d'Azur, and also represent the Minister of Higher Education and Research. So I'm going to give the floor to Claire Martin with CMA CGM, who will explain to you how this uh, world leader of maritime transport commits for biodiversity. Okay. So the first slide, in the CSR policy of CMA-CGM, we have three major pillars, people, planet, environment, and the last one, it's, we call it uh, fair trade. So within the scope of environment, our ambition is to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. This is the ambition of the group for all its activities, maritime transport of containers and logistics. So we want to be one of the leaders of the decarbonated solution for all of its activities of transport and storage We work on two major uh, directions, limit, reduce global warming by reducing the carbon footprint of all activities. And the second direction, and that's why we are partnering with this uh, uh, Congress of uh, Nature, by taking uh, charge of the whole carbon compensation of this whole uh, event. That's the commitment that we took towards the Congress. So our second major pillar is around the theme of biodiversity, and we have three steps. First, to know what we are talking about, we need to measure our impact measure the impact of all our activities on biodiversity. And we can't do that alone, of course. We need people who know, who can guide us through the various dimensions that we need to take in, into account when we do this assessment. 
That's why we're working with the charter sale, which is the, the charter of the Ministry of uh, Ecology with actors of the sector to really see what are the indicators that we should use and measure. Same thing with our partnership with the Foundation of the Sea on the ocean rever referential, the global compact that we are a member of, which also developed a methodology to measure what we are talking about on the climate stakes and the, bio the biodiversity stakes. And we're in the process of committing also to the label Green Marine Europe of the Surfrider Foundation. That's to uh, do the assessment. As soon as we assess, we can define what we should be working on to reduce the pressure that we have on biodiversity. We have six commitments, reduction of marine pollution, because this is one of the criteria that we're looking at very closely, working to uh, mitigate the loss of containers, hydrocarbons, uh, pollution, uh, also being a freight forwarder. Sometimes, of course, we um, move some uh, consumer goods or materials, but unfortunately, we find some endangered species. So we try to limit strictly the fact that we would put uh, endangered species in the container that we transport. So we work very closely with the customs authorities, with uh, the police, the law enforcement uh, agencies to limit any form of trafficking and put in place internally procedures that are very strong so they can avoid to transport endangered species. Third and commitment of the group, not to use the road of the north. This is a decision that was taken by our president, by CEO, because this uh, north route uh, goes through areas that are extremely vulnerable in terms of biodiversity. So we made the commitment that none of his ships would go through this route. Some people saying that it's the last uh, big maritime road to exploit, and we decided never to go there. Fourth commitment, work in favor of circular economy. That means recycling all the plastics on board or managing the end of life and the recycling of our boats, our ships. Fifth commitment, since we are an actor of the land logistics, we also want to fight against pollution on land. And then we need to train all our team members, our partners to all these challenges so it gets circulated in the company. So measure, reduce. And our third and last field of activity is to protect or restore the fragile ecosystems. And here I will let you discover the programs which we launched with some scientists, with some researchers or NGOs to detect and avoid uh, the, the whales and avoid bumping into them, any form of collisions with the whales. So we ask the captains to reduce the speed of the boats when they get into areas where they know that there are whales uh, crossing through, for example, to give birth, for example, in the south of the US. We work on projects around the restoration of the coral reefs that are uh, badly damaged. Uh, this is a very strong action of the group in five areas of the world. Uh, we have reforestation projects as well. And since uh, we are close to the VAR region, which was uh, severely hit by some, fire fire, by some fires, we launched a donation of a million euro for to contribute to the restoration of all those forests that we burned recently. We work on uh, carbon up offsetting programs that we propose to our clients. And also we work on the reduction of plastics. To recap, this is everything that the group is doing, all of it by partnering with NGOs, researchers, research centers. Thank you very much, Claire. 
for this presentation and uh, for this recap of the actions conducted by uh, your company. I'm going to give the floor to Franck Preciano, who will tell us how the Company Nationale of the Rhone commits to protect natural habitats and reconquer this biodiversity in places where it was impacted. Frank, you have the floor. I'm going to go to uh, the point. Uh, the Compagnie Nationale du Rhône is committed by its nature of manager of a river of 550 kilometer of length since the ecosystems from the Alps to the Mediterranean and Camargue ecosystems. The river Rhône uh, provides us with water to have some turbines. Uh, so in order not to consume water, we use the one that it provides. So we don't have those big tanks. We don't have a huge storage capacity. And the water that flows continues its uh, way and we try to promote actions to uh, support the biodiversity because uh, we have 92 percent of the Rhone Valley that is covered by uh, uh, protected areas, uh, natural sites, etc. So we have a habitat that is still resilient but is being uh, vulnerable because of all the pressure on the valley because this is one, uh, it's a very dense uh, traffic uh, area. There's a so we need to put in place concrete actions at our level within our perimeter. So these are the five cases priority, uh, five, sorry, uh, priority pillars that are here. We want to take in count, into account the stakes of biodiversity. We commit to restoration of waterways. One of the biggest program of uh, environmental restoration in the world have been, We've committed to it for the last 20 years, uh, fighting against the species uh, that are uh, pests and uh, invading uh, species. We have uh, committed for 20 years to a zero pesticide policy and also, and that uh, leads us to research, uh, reinforcing of our knowledge in environmental in the environment. So these are the scope of actions of research on the themes that are linked to biodiversity. We do a lot on the hydraulic uh, uh, projects on the environment and biodiversity, of course. On that part, uh, it's the whole of our actions of restoration and preservation of ecosystems identifying the stakes, the scientific stakes that are linked to biodiversity, uh, have put forward some goals uh, in terms of environment and follow up the projects. Same for the invasive species. We work on uh, innovation in the uh, inventory techniques. There was a round table yesterday on that topic. We do some surveys, uh, environmental surveys, to assess the biomass. And it's been developed by some uh, techniques uh, with the INRA of Tonon. So we can uh, adapt uh, those techniques on uh, waterway ecosystems. And we work uh, with a school uh, of research and environment in Switzerland. We work a lot on everything that is environmental management, environmental continuity, whether it's on land or on water. Uh, another example of what we do, uh, we work on eels. We follow up on the, follow up the eels who are start in the in the river and uh, go back to the sea. A few examples that I mentioned, uh, RONECO is the biggest program of scientific uh, monitoring of uh, ecological restoration. You can find the link very easily. There are several actors involved, institutions, uh, economic actors who work for the Rhone River. Um, Bio Rhone is this uh, 
program of uh, following the populations of fish on the French and the Swiss side. The project Vigilife, which is an initiative carried by uh, an association of companies, uh, labs, and different structures in order to promote the development of these techniques and the transfer of skills in territories where the actors would not have the technical, financial, or human resource means to put in place those techniques. We have another project, which is a DARAC project, which is, the again, the movement of the population of eels. And uh, I would like to go back uh, on uh, that. We also put up an association. Uh, the president is Eric Forsena, and this association contributes to make sure that waterways talk to each other. So the results of our research, we try to um, apply them to other uh, rivers and to put in relation managers and people who manage those rivers with scientists. I think I'm done here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now I turn over to uh, Jean-Philippe Nabo. He will talk to us about is a research institute that works for a healthy food and a sustainable use of resources. It will make a connection with climate change. And he will explain why uh, this partnership is important. The INRE works in agriculture, food, and environment. And uh, obviously, in the context of, a gl of global climate change, we are moreover going through an energy uh, transition and a, a digital transition. Biodiversity is at the heart of most of our research. Uh, we deal with a uh, cultivation, a uh, livestock, or uh, natural natural areas like marine environments, or and other uh, natural areas. So we uh, support uh, actions that are dedicated to restoring ecosystems. So we try to uh, preserve them, to improve their management, or to restore them. Those are long-term measures and actions because, first of all, we need to uh, to uh, know uh, how every e ecosystem works. And there's so many different ecosystems to take into account. So we uh, need uh, measures and uh, instruments that are tailored to each uh, environment so that we can better understand them. And then we can make uh, models and projections. We generally uh, give uh, priority to restoration uh, actions of different types. These actions can be based on a very dynamic of ecosystems. Uh, what I mean is that a, some uh, in some ecosystems, the, uh, the the number of species is decreasing, and so we don't aim to uh, restore the initial state of this ecosystem, but we try to reintroduce species to uh, improve the resilience of uh, the ecosystem. We uh, can uh, work in we work in uh, di diverse in very different areas. We can work on peri-urban uh, waters. Uh, some of them will have to uh, change uh, their function. We'll have a different functions in uh, the future. We also work in polluted sites with uh, polluted soils. Our aim is obviously to uh, uh, end this pollution. And we're not the only one to work uh, towards the pollution because we have different, uh, different partnerships. We work with uh, management agencies, collectivities, professionals, businesses, associations. And we also work with uh, agriculture authorities, uh, agribusinesses, and so on. We also work more and more on nature-based solutions. 
this is a very ambitious challenge, even though this concept is not new. Nature-based solutions focus on natural processes, and they don't uh, only attend to restoration. They uh, can also involve agricultural research. We try to uh, start using phytosanitary product, and we try to focus on natural processes. For example, uh, we have uh, created a circular uh, vegetable uh, garden with a uh, species that uh, pests really love, uh, meaning that uh, farmers won't have to suffer uh, because of uh, them. So, but our uh, Broad, broader aim is to reinforce, to enhance biodiversity in uh, crops so uh, that the uh, pest predators won't uh, represent a risk for a crop. So we tend uh, to uh, to uh, work on this kind of method. We also work in the field of agroforestry, which combines agriculture and non-anthropogenic areas. So what are the results of this research? To sum up, this research can improve the quality of soils, uh, improve the uh, carbon storage in soils, and to uh, ensure a, a better use of soil, a more sustainable use of soil. We also uh, want to have a temporary uh, meadows. So it is about a cultivation, innovation. It evolves permanently. Thank you very much. And now I uh, give the floor to Astrid Bergel. Uh, she works for a BNP Paribas, and she will uh, tell us how the bank invests in research programs. And she may also, um, also talk about the funding provided by uh, the bank. And we will have a, a few minutes uh, for you to ask questions after that. Good morning, everyone. BNP Paribas is a bank, one of the largest banks in the world. We don't necessarily have an industrial footprint like my co-panelists, but our impact on biodiversity is significant because we uh, we give uh, money to business and these businesses have an impact on biodiversity so that's what i am going to talk about and there will be three parts first of all we will talk about sponsorship the sponsorship provided by the uh, bnp paribas foundation in order to support research in the field of biodiversity uh, there is a call for application every th three years. The next one will be in 2022. There are researchers here with us, and our aim is to finance, to fund research. We need to uh, understand what are the connections between uh, ecosystems, and our foundation has the uh, plays this role. We research, we finance research with many researchers and we have already provided 18 million euros funding our foundation also shares uh, knowledge and raise awareness among the general uh, public we have raised awareness about climate change and biodiversity protection uh, to for with 400,000 uh, million people the sponsorship uh, is really important for us and my co-panelists have mentioned it several times we uh, need uh, measures adjusted uh, tailored measures and we need to carry out all the work that comes before action and uh, we are really committed uh, uh, to uh, this and that's why we want to ensure that our investment portfolio is made up of businesses that don't have a negative impact on biodiversity and if we want to reach this target we need to make assessments we have different indicators but this is a really uh, a difficult uh, task there that's the reason why uh, we are uh, 
we are lagging behind compared to uh, climate uh, change. Uh, one of our department is in charge of asset management, and several asset managers have met, and we uh, finance a consulting uh, society company called Iceberg Atala, and this uh, company has developed a methodology to assess biodiversity according to uh, tailored indicators. So we are still uh, uh, developing this methodology and this is a re this is a research we're carrying out research and this research is crucial for us to take action in the future furthermore there is the TNFT the nature related financial disclosure task force it is a, a global initiative with global actors that aims to standardize everything so we can actually ask for reports to uh, financial services have to report to us tell us what they do so we can standardize our action in the future and so that's for the methodology related to the protection of biodiversity and uh, finally when we talk about research innovations never is, is, is related they are innovating businesses that will emerge from our research and then BNP Paribas since 2015 has committed to support uh, startups who uh, work towards energy transition. It, uh, if you want to protect the planet, there's more uh, to biodiversity. So we have started a partnership with a Bertrand Picard. Bertrand Picard has launched an initiative called uh, 1000 Solutions for the Planet. BNP Paribas has, uh, has been really strongly involved in this process. And once you get uh, solutions, then startups need to grow. That's when we launched a fund using the expertise of Solar Impulse and our experience in supporting uh, to the startups who uh, work for energy transition. And together, we work towards creating nature-based solutions, solutions that we need to protect biodiversity and to restore habitats. Thank you very much, Astrid. Time flies. I just had a look at my clock and we don't have much time left. However, I had a question to ask to uh, the two uh, business representatives uh, here. It is a question about research. So, which scientific instrument do we need to develop to assess your impact on biodiversity? And I understand that there are many uh, settings, many in characteristic, many elements to take into account for decarbonation. But what about biodiversity? What are the indicators uh, you use to assess your impact? You assess specific indicators to measure your impact. There are many. Uh, dimensions, aspects to take into account, but are your method uh, homogeneous to measure biodiversity? I'll try to be brief. As for businesses, we are familiar with the carbon footprint, but now we need to use the biodiversity footprint we uh, instruments are being developed and we uh, count on our partners to develop such instruments we will provide them with the data with our data we will provide them with data about co2 and emissions 
but we don't know how much data we will need to provide to uh, get to know this uh, biodiversity footprint. So we need the help of laboratories and startups, and we work uh, with startups. Startups are looking for a solution, and they themselves work with laboratory. To conclude with, we work within an ecosystem. Our president, our chair, has launched a coalition because we work with energy suppliers with our clients so we can federate and because we all need to calculate this uh, biodiversity footprint. Beyond the definition of indicators, although indicators are necessary to uh, carry out an assessment, we need to define our ecological objectives because if we need to restore to uh, how we need to uh, determine what we're going to do and we, we need to know the uh, areas we work on very uh, well. The CNR works on the uh, Rhone Basin, but there are many actors involved. There can be different uh, types dif of restoration in different areas. So how can we assess the impact of the uh, different businesses on the different areas where they operate? So we need to define specific indicators to each business, and that's a major challenge. And we talked about uh, sponsorship. We mentioned uh, capital risk. We uh, mentioned uh, startups. So, as for BNP Paridas, how do you proceed? That is, how do you uh, how do you get to know the subject? The aim of this roundtable is to address a research, but we uh, talked about startups and sponsorship uh, in the field of research and all uh, traditional uh, fundings uh, are, are here, are still here. And within a bank, within the banking world, we have developed tools to encourage businesses uh, to improve. We uh, try. We, we, we started with CO2 criteria and the uh, credit rate goes down when the when the said business improves its carbon footprint. These past two years, there has been a growing number of uh, such success stories in biodiversity. So they are fields in which biodiversity is key. And uh, there are uh, businesses for which biodiversity is key. And these bu businesses are encouraged to uh, improve the biodiversity footprint. They can also assess the biodiversity footprint with external instruments. So what we do here is that we uh, uh, give an added value. We use our role as financier to help uh, companies to uh, become greener and to improve biodiversity. And businesses, uh, businesses say that uh, it is interesting for them to have a lower rate but it gives them an opportunity to uh, take all employees, the whole, uh, whole uh, groups on board and uh, all together get a lower impact on biodiversity. Thank you, Astrid. So uh, now, are there any questions? Okay, so the yeah, the microphone the microphone is working. Yes, Julie Jouancel, I had a question for BNP. The first one is uh, the CDC Biodiversity, which is a branch of the CDC Investment, developed a tool of scoring of impact. Uh, I don't know why you take a different one and why you develop your own. Whether uh, versus trying to combine forces. And I wanted to know what is the perimeter of the measure because the global activity of BNP, are you going to assess all the biodiversity, the impact on biodiversity throughout all your activities? And the third question is, uh, 
which is logical. Uh, it's great to invest in uh, sustainable activity. What is the agenda of BNB on the divestment of uh, non-sustainable uh, economy? Uh, on the methodology, I don't know the details of the CDC biodiversity methodology. I know their works in general. The point here uh, to develop uh, our own uh, tool of asset management um, is to have something because we are managing assets. Uh, we're looking at 600 billion. So we need uh, things that can be automated very easily. We're going to manage a lot of data. And this is quite particular. I would like to say that CDC biodiversity is more about restoring habitats on particular projects. Of course, with the idea that uh, the different methodologies uh, could uh, talk to each other. We don't want to reinvent the wheel every time we do something. The second question was on We published a paper on biodiversity and we realized how tricky it is throughout our entire scope. BNP Paribas is the um, individual's bank, is corporate banks, is uh, ma the asset management, is real estate, is insurance. It's a lot of things. So we are starting with uh, where we have the biggest impact, which is investment because we have a uh, good lever to know if we invest or not. Uh, also for loans to uh, companies. So we try to act when the impact on biodiversity is going to be the greatest, depending on the sector. And then we try to roll it out. So that's how we work on uh, carbon. We started working on coal, then oil and gas. And now we're on carbon. So uh, I think we're going to do it uh, the same way. And the last question on uh, the pathways. Yes, uh, we're working on impact investment. Uh, what uh, part does it represent? We committed a few months ago to join the Net Zero Banking Alliance. So we'll be carbon neutral on our portfolio, on the companies that we finance. And uh, we do that sector by sector. We d developed a methodology about among the biggest banks in order to be extremely consistent on the subject. And slowly, gradually, our portfolio is going to get greener and greener when we have the power uh, to reduce 20% of the global emissions. Uh, we're just at the beginning in terms of biodiversity, but I assume we're going to be going about it the same way. Thank you, Astrid, for this very comprehensive answer. Any other questions in the room? No? No further question. I had the last question. Claire, uh, can you tell us just a, a couple of words on the startup uh, Nautilus Plus that is incubated with the box uh, at the City of Innovation and Knowledge of the City of Marseille? I find the startup very interesting. It does a lot uh, to promote biodiversity with in artificial intelligence and many uh, knowledge to depollute. Uh, Yes, Notilo Plus is the name of the startup, which is incubated at The Box, which is the incubator, which was launched by our CEO, Rodolphe Sardin, a few years ago. And this uh, company has developed a kind of a small robot or drone that can go underwater, which is not an easy task. I would say um, underwater drone, which is less than going to use geolocalization and artificial intelligence to identify and uh, look at the hulls of the boats. And what is important for us is that they're going to see where the hulls are uh, dirty. And as soon as they see that the the hulls are being uh, are dirty. There could be some invasive species also there. So because thanks to this drone, it's going to send a very precise information of the localization, localization of the dirty part patches. And we send teams to clean them up as soon as possible and to prevent the development of these uh, species. You can see this robot uh, in the Generation Nature uh, stand booth. 
you can go and see it throughout the week. So I think we've uh, gone way ab beyond our time. I want to thank all our panelists, and I wish you a very good afternoon within this beautiful Congress. Thank you very much. And feel free to uh, come and ask us questions outside if you want.